You know, right now, when you're, when you're clapping, you're really showing your appreciation to them and their gifts, and that's always appropriate. But sometimes when we're worshiping, when we're in the midst of worshiping, and God is the focus, we recognize, man, I just don't feel like clapping now. I just want to worship. Don't. Don't. Just be still and receive the gift that they're offering to God. It's powerful. But just know that they have spent many hours rehearsing and practicing getting this so that what they offer to God is the best. It's what we bring to God as well. We bring to God collectively uh, our first fruit, our, our best time, our best talent, our best treasure. We bring it to God. And when we bring it together, there's something that happens that's incredible. Stephen Covey, in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, calls it synergy or to synergize. It, it's, it's the melding of two words, synthesis, which means to blend together, and energy or energize, which means power and strength. And, and when we have synthesis with energy, we get synergize. We, we get something. It's like the disciples in the first church. You know, they, they really had to work together. But it was a learning experience. They had to develop a habit of working together because they were working in such close proximity physically, emotionally, and definitely spiritually. For instance, do you know what kind of car the disciples drove? A Honda. A Honda, because you can find it in Honda. In chapter 2 of the book of Acts, verse 1, it says, All the disciples were together in one accord. <sighs> Guess I should have warned you, huh? But now stop and think about that. The disciples were together in one accord of mind, Body, spirit, they had left everything that gave them identity and comfort. And they had left behind the earthly securities to follow Jesus for the heavenly hope. They had, in a word, synergized. They had come together. Synergy is, is a powerful concept. And Stephen Covey he explains it in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. When synergy actually happens, there's no real designated leader. Everyone comes together and they collectively bring and pool their thoughts. It is a melding together that it goes beyond explanation. And sometimes when that happens, miraculous events can occur. Things that, that you just didn't think could happen, but because of the power of the collective it's able to happen. He has an equation in his book that says one plus one does not equal two. When you synergize, one plus one can equal three. More happens than what meets the eye. I believe that's because when we work together, the power of the Holy Spirit comes in here. The downside of that is that we don't always synergize. We don't always work together. Think about it when you and your spouse are having a disagreement and it's a long time disagreement. You can't really accomplish a lot together, or families, families that, that should be working together, families that should be loving one another, families that should be looking out for each other's best interest, but there's something going on inside the family, and they're strained, and they're stretched, and, they're, and there is no synergy. Quite often, what happens is that when something critical changes our perspective from ourself to the circumstance outside of us, synergy happens. Like when a tragic death occurs and all of a sudden our agendas are put aside and we come together. A tragic shooting at a school, a catastrophic, catastrophic natural disaster. When those things happen, people change their perspective and they come together collectively pooling their time, their talents, and their treasure, and, and a beautiful synergy happens. You can't even describe it, and you certainly can't orchestrate it. It just happens. I want to share with you that I believe if we can get into the habit of truly experiencing synergy, we can experience the power, the power that God has for His church. When two or three come together, and the focus is the same. Powerful things can happen. Now, I know that Stephen Covey's concept 
synergy works really, really well in corporations, but it can work really, really well in the church and in families and in communities. Question is, how do we get there? I've transferred Stephen Covey's seven habits of highly effective people into seven habits of wholly disciplined people. And habit number six, I call harmony in the herd. Harmony in the herd. I read a little booklet on Christian leadership that said, well, the title was Shepherding Horses. You know, we're talked about as being sheep in the Bible, and trying to shepherd sheep is one thing. Trying to shepherd horses is a whole new concept, but it's one that I at least can understand and resonate because when there is harmony in the herd, everything is working smoothly. Horses have really one unified focus. Let's find food and let's flee from danger. Let's keep ourselves safe and let's find food. This is really, and when they work together, there can be incredible harmony in the herd. But there's still inside the horse community or the herd a pecking order. And sometimes that pecking order arises when people have disagreements. Horses have disagreements just like horses. I mean, just like people do. And and when that happens, when we have a disagreement with another person, we can choose to first understand rather than be understood, another one of the habits, or we can insist on our way, and when that happens, fights occur. And no one walks away from a fight without somebody being hurt. Maybe not physically, but emotionally, even scarred and so resentful. And if we can get past this squabbling, now I recognize there are some people in the herd we are never going to change. They are those EGR people, extra grace required. You're not going to get them to join in the synergy. They're just not going to get with the program. They're going to be on the outside looking in. Nothing's ever their way. It's never good enough. It's never right enough. And they're always complaining and whining. And let me just tell you, you're probably not going to change those folks. That's not our focus. And those folks do not define us as a church. It's the synergy of the herd, the congregation. When we come together and we have one focus, and that focus is Jesus Christ, something beautiful happens, mysterious, beyond our comprehension. When we recognize that we have been called together because of the one who hung upon the cross, because of the one who chose to bleed and die, because of the one who was resurrected, when we realize that we have come together because of Jesus, there can be harmony in the herd. We no longer get upset about whether or not we should do this or should do that or what time this happens or whether the worship service should look like this or that. No, no, because our focus is synergistic. We have brought together the synthesis of the people of God with the energy and passion, and something incredible happens. If you brought your Bibles with you this morning, church, would you hold them up? Ah, thank you for bringing your Bibles. Turn to the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. While you're turning to chapter 10, share a confession. Last night, my wife and I, this is dating us too, We watched once again, at least most of, before we were getting tired and went to sleep, we watched Jesus Christ Superstar. Come on, everybody that's seen that before, raise your hands. Uh Uh, You have to be at least as old as us. It's a powerful coming together. Now, the talent that was involved in these dancers and singers, it was just pulled together, and it's it's what synergized. It, It really is. It's what can happen When people come together for one particular purpose, Jesus called the disciples together. He called them together, and they had the possibility and the opportunity to truly experience synergy. Now, in chapter 10, the Gospel of Mark, verse 32, verse 32. They were on the road going to Jerusalem. And Jesus was walking ahead of them. They were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. He took the twelve aside, and he began to tell them what was going to happen. See, we are going up to Jerusalem, 
And the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit upon him. They will flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise again. Now what Jesus told them was an opportunity is coming to you. An opportunity for you to come together. An opportunity for you to keep your focus. An opportunity for you to experience why I called you here in the first place. And it's to transform the world. I called you together to share the truth of God. The gospel. I am the gospel. I came. This is get prepared. And instead of being unified, here's what happened. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward and said to Jesus, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said, What is it that you want? Grant us to sit one at your right hand, at one at your left in glory. They had the opportunity to experience synergy, to come together as one. And the first thing that they do, who's going to be on top? Who's going to be in the pecking order? Who's going to be in charge? All of a sudden, they're starting to think selfishly, and that's not synergy. It's not what Jesus, it's not harmony in the herd. As a matter of fact, if you drop down, I believe, to verse 41, when the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John, and rightfully so. Who are they to assume that they're going to get to sit on? Same thing happens in church, my brothers and sisters. We start to become upset, less than harmonious, uh, less than having harmony in the herd. We start to have bitter feelings against another person. This is what Jesus said. You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as rulers, they lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it's not so among you. Whosoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Turn to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, chapter 12. The disciples did not learn this lesson about having harmony. Harmony in the herd of those that follow. They didn't learn it right. It had to become habitual for them. And and they had another opportunity right here as Jesus entered into Jerusalem. Verse 12 in the Gospel of John. The next day the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a donkey and sat on it as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming and he's sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered the things that had been written of him and the things that had been done to him. So the crowd that had been following him the one that called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, they continued to testify. And it was also because of this that he had performed the sign for the crowd that went out to meet him. And the Pharisees said to one another, Look, you see, no one can do anything. The whole world has gone after him. There was a pooling together of the disciples of Jesus Christ. People were waving palm branches. People were shouting, Hosanna. There was synergy. But Jesus knew it wasn't a habit yet. These habits just don't come by accident. They come by learning and understanding the Word of God. They come by mutual teaching and understanding. Jesus wasn't finished teaching the disciples. In the Gospel of John, chapter 13. In chapter 13, Jesus actually sits down to wash the disciples' feet. Chapter 13, verse 7. You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus said, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Now, verse 12. After he had finished washing their feet, he put on his robe. He returned to the table. He said, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right. 
That is what I am. So if I, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's. I have set an example for you that you should do as I have done. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are the messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now, it doesn't mean that we're supposed to just wash Jesus' feet. It means we're supposed to serve one another. We're supposed to count each other as being on the same plane. And it doesn't matter how long we've been a follower of Jesus Christ. Some of us have been a follower for decades. Some of us are just now coming into faith. Jesus sees no pecking order in the herd that is the followers. Jesus sees that we should be together in harmony, serving one another faithfully. Turn over to chapter 14 now. Chapter 14. Verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, if you knew me, you will know my Father. And from now on, you do know him and have seen him. Verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate to be with you. This is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him because He abides with you and will be in you. Verse 25, I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and will remind you of all that I have said to you. And now verse 15, verse 15, beginning with verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I call you friends because I have made known to you everything that I heard from the Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. So the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. Greater love. Except one lay down their life for another. Jesus left us an example an incredible example of what it means to truly see each other as holy, as righteous, as worthy of serving. Harmony in the herd. It happens sometimes with our horses. Not all the time. But there are some times when we can look out over the back field and they are not only grazing peacefully, but there are some, some horses that are resting. You may not be aware of this, but when another horse in the herd lays down to rest, to get that, that, that peace that they need in the moment, the rest of the herd is watching out for them. The rest of the herd is alert and looking up in case danger should come. For us as the church, we have one purpose, one commission. That is to make disciples in the name of Jesus Christ. Yes, we baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but first and foremost, we make disciples. And we can't necessarily make disciples if we're not in this together. We all have differing gifts. Differing gifts, and when they are pulled together, something incredible happens. This much I know. For wherever two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus Christ, He is there in their midst. When we gather together, when we gather in worship, when we gather in Bible study, when we gather in prayer, when we gather to... When somebody passes so quickly, Jesus is there. Yesterday, Paul and Debbie Hunt just showed up at our home. They just showed up. Unannounced. They just showed up. They showed up because Paul was grieving for the death of Alan. He needed to have some holy presence right then 
right there. And so we sat down and had conversation and mutually encouraged one another, not as pastor, parishioner, but as brother to brother, disciples. You see, this is what the church is for, friends. We should be there for one another always, no matter what we're going through. We should be so connected, if you will, synthesized, experiencing synergy. When one is hurting, we stop and hurt with them. When one is rejoicing, we join in the rejoicing. We truly are in this together. Jesus tried to convince the disciples of that, and he sent the Holy Spirit to remind us. Stay together. Stay focused. Have harmony. One mind, one spirit, one focus. And then when we see the return of Jesus Christ, we can shout, Hosanna! Hallelujah! The king is coming, and we've all been taking part of the heirs to the kingdom. Let's prepare to close out our service as we pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that you continue to remind us to take upon us the habit of having harmony in the church, having unity of spirit. Help us to become habitual by throwing animosity and jealousness and envy and strife way out the door. Help us to experience that power that comes from your Holy Spirit. The energy that comes from our collective pooling of our talents and our gifts. And Lord, as your kingdom come here on earth, may we sense a bit of your glory. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, may it be so in your name, Jesus. Amen. You can close your Bibles and take out your hymnal and turn to page 402. And the closing hymn is, Lord, I want to be a Christian. I want to be a Christian. How many consider yourselves Christians? Raise your hands. Good. How many consider yourselves disciples of Jesus Christ? Raise your hand. See, that's a little bit slower. How many of you would lay your life down for another? To claim the name of Christian is to understand what Jesus did when he called us to be part of his holy herd. He called us to leave behind that which gives us security in this life and to take upon our lives that almost insecurity but a holy, healthy understanding that my security is not in this world or even in this life. I'm looking forward to the next life because Jesus promised it to be so. And in this life, I will invest it in the kingdom of God and I will serve together with my brothers and sisters in the church. There will be harmony in the church as far as it depends upon me and collectively we will prepare for your return. May it be so in the name of Jesus. Amen.